just enjoy the moment before, shall we? <laughs> I mean, you never do appreciate the womb until it's gone. <laughs> so, before this becomes a theater and I become me and you become you and we become different, let's all just stay. Undefined. Feel yourself sharing all the dirty molecules of all these succulent strangers. <laughs> mm, breathe. Mm. You know, right now this show could be anything. So let's not worry about what happens in the light. Just Breathe in the blackness. Nothing. But full of possibility. Yes. This blackness is me. And this is me trying to fill the void. Can you feel that? If you strain? Even now, you can probably already start to see me. Your eyes are adjusting to this little bit of light. Or is it that my voice and my presence fill in a shape that I will soon betray when the lights come up? Thin reality compared to what we feel, which is full and thick and buzzing. Rafa, will you bring up the uh, blue light? Yeah. <laughs> and now, with uh, just a little color, light broken up, there is something known. And there are judgments made. Black people look better under blue light. <laughs> a theater friend of mine tells me this before then doing the obligatory reminder to anyone in the earshot. He's not trying to be racist, it's just true. <laughs> because it is important to distinguish truth from racism. <laughs> Dude, it's okay. Like, you're allowed to know things about both theater and black people. <laughs> I too think that brown looks pretty good with blue, and it is nice not to be so damn shiny in the light. And you know, maybe, maybe blue light just helps you see the ghosts in black people's faces a little bit better. Oh, don't get me wrong, white people have ghosts too. Everybody does. But you know, I, I meet more white people with um, pink souls. You know, new, fresh, healthy, pink <laughs> souls. And uh, I don't know that a black soul can stay pink for very long. And that's sad, because there's nothing more beautiful on someone's face than an open heart, in any light. Oh shit, here we go. <laughs> Lights up, and it is just one woman on stage wearing black, being black. <laughs> black! <laughs> Well, you guys sit in likely half-broken chairs, and uh, I get ready to do a show I brought to you in a trunk. Fuck. <laughs> Dude, you guys paid for this shit to happen to you, so I don't even feel that bad. <laughs> I mean, at least with like a real play, you know, like, uh, you know, like at least you know the writing's gonna be good. You know, like you go to the theater and you're like, well, now I've seen Hamlet, you know? <laughs> this, this is new and experimental and possible. Terrible. <laughs> you know, like, at least with a real play, it's kind of like TV because people on stage are talking to each other and not you, so you're free to just sit there and, like, fantasize about which one of them you want to fuck, you know? <laughs> but it's just me up here, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, that is right. I am going to talk to you about race, and then your boner is going to die. <laughs> like read some slave narratives and we'll whip ourselves in the closet and get real sad. I don't, 
I don't know, look, we got to get into it today, you guys, okay? We've got an entire show about race that we have to get through, okay? I made it, y'all paid it, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't want to do a show about race, okay? You guys don't want to see a show about race. I mean, you do want to say that you saw a very important show about race. And I want to say I did that show. You know? we're, all, we're, all just, we're all just buying and selling to each other like good capitalists do so the terrorists don't win, all right? I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that there's enough like games and laughs and distractions to make all of this fun. And then I'm just going to like shove a bunch of stuff about race in there at the end. And we're all going to feel real awkward. Uh, but we all will have gotten our money's worth. I will snake you with a story. Yeah, that's right. You are going to get to know me and love me, and then I won't be black to you anymore. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, ooh, oh, children of all ages, welcome to the carnival, yeah! It's Baby, so step right up, step right up, and enjoy all that you see. Because oh. <laughs> if you are not watching the show, baby, you are the show. So slap on a smile and get the fuck out there, honey. There are, there are people waiting, and they are expecting to see something. Games, amusements, dares, scares, food on a stick. <laughs> Sugar and booze and flesh and explosions, yeah! <laughs> there are gonna be games to play and stories to tell. Oh, so many stories to tell. And don't forget the gargantuan, grotesque, gratuitous, all empowering, all devouring, tall baby. <laughs> but first, I want you to buy me. That's right, me, Desiree Birch. I want you to buy me as a household name. I want you to buy me as a friend, a lover, a daughter, an equal, a superior. I want you to buy me a cotton candy so I enjoy this as much as you're gonna. Oh, don't worry, I will work for it. I got a song, I got a dance, I got a story about how it all began. About how I became me, and you became you, in a very general and personal way, but with a lot more stuff. We will begin today's festivities with our opening parade of characters. Yes, I know I said this was a solo show, but I'm gonna need you to use your imaginations and your legs. All rap begins in Africa, where everyone is black. Like the world all over, they enslaved each other after every attack. You had a tribe, you had a home, now to Sudan your family grows up. All right, kids, you know what time it is? It's slavery time. Everybody's least favorite fucking time. <laughs> Let's see what we got out here for slaving material, huh? Need some strapping young bucks. Ah, yeah, that one right there. Yeah, you never should smile at the person in the show. Come on. <laughs> Stand up. All right, come on over here. Come on over here, my friend. All right, now we are going to take you right here to uh, Sudan, which you know by stage left. Hang out over there. Now, my friend, do you happen to know what grows in Sudan? Oh, well, I'm about to tell you. It's rice! So much rice! And we're going to need you to pick up all that rice, okay? Every last grain of it, because we got all these hungry mouths, so do you think you can handle it? Yeah, you better figure it out real quick. I'll be back to check on you. Okay. Next verse. One blinding day, some Dutch arrived with verses filled with guns. They swapped their arms for bodies, split up the daughters and sons. You had a son, you had a wife, you had so much, but fuck your life, you so, so, so. All right, now we're talking about the Dutch, those freaky 
Dinky Dinky Dutch. We know about them. They like it in multiple. So you know, I'm gonna need a. I'm gonna need you. Yes, and I'm gonna need everybody blocking you in while we're at it. Okay, so everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. You can leave your purses there. You won't need them where you're going. All right. <laughs> Yeah. 
and they were greedy, right? They weren't evildoers, they were just regular people being real, real greedy, right? And they had to pour a lot of sugar on that pill to get everybody else to swallow it, so it got the poor ones to pick the sugar. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right, you guys are poor, get out of here, ew. Gross. Come on, go back to your seats, slavery ended 150 years ago. Wait, not you. <laughs> All right, Charlie. Now, tell me, how does it feel? How does it feel to be black, man? Come on, right? <laughs> you were over there in Sudan. You got killed. You're definitely black. <laughs> All right, yeah, I know. It kind of hurts a little bit, right? It's a little bit rough. Now, uh, I know, I know. I'm fucking with you a little bit. You're thinking, come on, Desiree, I'm no fool. I'm no ignoramus. I know that there's more to being black than just that. I mean, I saw 12 years a slave, <laughs> and I cried. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw Django Unchained, and I, I laughed. Are we saying laughed? Okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, I know, about, I know about black people. I took African dance in summer camp. <laughs> yeah, I grew up on old school Motown, old school hip hop, old school jazz. I was raised by thugs, because there wasn't any wolves around. Man. Yeah, I know black people just else. I got the best style, the best music, and the best genitalia. <laughs> I mean, come on, some of my best friends are black. My iPhone is black. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, I know. You probably wouldn't be feeling so defensive, man, if, uh, if racism wasn't a big problem in the world, right? Racism bad, right? So you know what? You and me, Charlie, we're going to fix it, all right? You and me right here, right now. All right, grab that. We are gonna fix racism. We're gonna do it the good old fashioned American ingenuity way. We are gonna roll up our sleeves and beat the shit out of it, all right? <laughs> we are gonna take this sledgehammer here. Oh, and we are gonna beat the shit out of racism. Yes, okay. Oh. Here 
a community organizer. <laughs> Loves. You show up in neighborhoods that black people don't even want to go into. <laughs> With a flint board and shit. Uh, <laughs> here, that is some pretty impressive stuff there, Charlie. You're going to go ahead and get to wear that. That way everybody knows to fill out your survey at the end. <laughs> Alright, you can go and have a seat. Thank you so much. Pretty close. Anybody else there think they got the stuff to beat the shit out of racism? Hmm. Maybe there's a lady out there. Maybe there's a lady who thinks that she can knock it out of the park. Maybe there's someone who wants to see the rest of the show. <laughs> <laughs> That was 
that's fucking great. We came together, we struggled together, we pretended that game wasn't rigged together. <laughs> <laughs> Did we fix racism though? No. no. But are we a little bit more satisfied? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Come on, we did try. We tried. We tried to do something about the great unfixable, all right? We tried and we paid. We are all now totally post-racial. Yeah. We don't even see race anymore. Everyone is just white. <laughs> Somebody, uh, 
turn you into a thing, turn you into an object of their curiosity or interest? Uh, not that I can remember. No, interesting. <laughs> no one's ever thinged you. <laughs> um, I, I, no, not that, I can, not that I can remember. Has anybody ever made you feel like less than a person? Just for a second. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I was at my local bar, I nudged some guy, and he gave me like a, this was like a couple weeks ago, he, he gave me a nasty look. Um, uh -huh. I, I, think, I think I just touched his elbow. Okay. But to him, it was like, how dare you? I, Touch me! Yeah. How dare you? Yeah. And how did that make you feel? Oh, like, like less than that person. Like you were like a gross piece of blob that should never even thought to touch him. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it's been a pleasure doing business with you there, friend. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead and go back to your seat. Yeah, all right. So see now, look, we've all had a little piece of history, a little piece of the present, and now we had a little piece of each other. Yeah? Uh, we might all be feeling kind of satisfied with ourselves and maybe a little bit sick of ourselves, but shit, they don't serve carrot sticks in a fucking carnival now, do they? <laughs> And gentlemen, ever have that voice inside of your head criticizing every move that you make? Ever have a double of you that's really just the trouble of you? Welcome to the Freak Show, where you get two for the price of one. Yes, where the girls are so nice we ogle them twice. Where the sideshow becomes the main stage. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the Siamese Twins. <laughs> we are not from Siam. Yes, I am. Shut up. <laughs> Girl, we not even friends. That depends. Grow up. I could get myself unstuck. With a little bit of luck, I could use a helping hand. But all you have is your friend. As long as no one's looking, our lives are both an open book. One of us keeps lookout while the other does the dirty work. We're trying to come together but we can't quite make it. We trying to let go and we can't quite break it. I strike the pose that they will all find pleasing. And just what lies behind that smile you're squeezing? It's power, it's shame, it's grace, it's lame. You can Feel the connection, just hear all that laughter. Maybe that laughter is all that they're after. One part knows that minds are changing, and one part just watches them rearranging. Oh, it's fun to watch us pull and twist. So then, do you need me to exist? Look. Maybe if we just, oh God, no, <laughs> they're looking. <laughs> <laughs> they are so easy to please though. They must think of us like some kind of a whore. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, why's it gonna be like that? I didn't make the rules, but you know I'm not wrong. So then what the hell am I supposed to do here? Oh, I don't think anyone expects you to do anything. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna go out there. How do I look? <laughs> like a mammy, like a mess, like a child, like a welfare queen, like a busted tube of oatmeal cookie dough. You don't look like anything I would take seriously. Cookie dough? <laughs> cookie dough. <laughs> well, you asked. What if you're wrong? What if I'm not? Which one is worse? What do you think when you always have two minds about everything? 
For twins can join on not halves of a whole, but two individuals vying for one role. So how did we decide that we needed each other? And when? Ladies and gentlemen, the last thing that should be in a carnival is a fucking mirror, okay? <laughs> Seriously, nobody wants to see themselves. In this playground of the grotesque, every gesture is an exaggeration. Every house, a haunted house. Every ride, death-defying. Every lollipop, a pizza. <laughs> and as you struggle to make sense of it all, you realize that you have entered the fun house. I am a go-getter. I'm a real go-getter. I'm 25 years old now, and I'm going to be in another NYU student film. <laughs> it's, a, it's a webisode. I mean, that's basically something a bunch of college kids younger than I am came up with while they were getting stoned on a twin bed. <laughs> the character's name is Laquanvia. Because <laughs> all black names are made of those ten-point Scrabble letters you don't know what the fuck to do with. <laughs> and she will be the uh, comic relief while the very white protagonists struggle with their very white problems. Her character description will likely involve a civil service position and definitely involve the word sassy. Guys, <laughs> what the fuck is sassy, man? That's something you call a bratty 12-year-old or a cat. <laughs> oh, it's my turn to audition. <sighs> and I enter the room, and a bunch of would-be hipsters all sit behind a table, and, and they all shake my hand, and they tell me that they're very excited to have me there. They've read my resume, and they've heard about me. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, Desiree. Okay, thanks. Hold the elevator! <laughs> See. <laughs> okay, so uh, now I'm mid-audition, and I gracefully leap through their various hoops. Yeah, Desiree, that was great, you know, but um, we're looking for something a little bit more cupcakes and razor blades, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh -oh. um, you're giving me a lot of November. I really need more October. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally, I got it, got it, okay. <laughs> Hold the elevator! Yeah, Desiree, great, more, more. Uh, hold the elevator! <laughs> I have to go back to hold the elevator. Why couldn't you heal me? I'm the deaf one. <laughs> no, seriously, I do everything that they ask me to do, and any way that they ask me to do it. And then, then finally, the, the main hipster, the one with the facial hair made of irony, um, <laughs> he gives me the actual piece of direction, what they'd all been wanting to tell me since I walked in. He says, could you do it a little bit more uh, urban? Uh, OK. Um, Hold the fucking elevator, forget about it! <laughs> no, 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 um, I mean, do it more street. Okay, uh... Hold the elevator, Hong Kong! <laughs> no, I mean, do it like the clumps. Okay, wait, wait a second. <laughs> None of the things that this guy's saying actually go together, like... Does he want me to do it like I'm selling drugs and I got like tiger paws tattooed on my titties? Or does he want me to do it like I live in a Lower East Side tenement with a hundred different people from a thousand different countries? Or does he want me to do it like I'm in an Eddie Murphy remake where everybody's sitting around the table eating chicken fried steak and chicken fried chicken and chicken fingers and their own fingers because they're too obese to move? <laughs> they all do mean the same thing. They mean black. To someone who has no idea what that means, he means do it more black because you're not being black enough. And then there's this exchange look of, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, I got it, <laughs> totally, black it up, okay. I'll say it, I'll say it, hold the elevator, motherfucker, I done told y'all to hold that fucking elevator, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> the
Oh, I guess we should ask Ms. Dolezal about that one. <laughs> but like, look, I grew up in white suburbia, right? I definitely remember us being the black family on the block. <laughs> but then suddenly I grew up and then that was all gone. Like, I don't know how I lost it, you know? I mean, I guess I never really was one to belong to any kind of groups. Like, I, I was the only fat black lady in first through twelfth grade, so there wasn't a lot of community for me. <laughs> but, in high school, I discovered the theater. <laughs> and then suddenly, my difference was given value. So, uh, in uh, senior year of high school, I have this drama friend named Steve. He was like the class clown. Even in theater class, he was the class clown. Um, is there anybody here who was a class clown? Like, goofed off and did all kinds of shit? Yeah? You're the class clown? Okay, cool. Come on up here for a second. Come on up here. Alright. So, stand right here and uh, tell everybody your name. Uh, my name is Meg. All right, so this is Meg. <laughs> Meg's a class clown. So Meg, what kinds of things, you can go ahead and have a seat right there. So what kinds of things would you do as a class clown? I would say probably a lot of swearing and dirty stuff, I think. Got it. Then would you say this in class so that like, the teacher could hear it, or was it just to everybody else? To everybody else, and the teacher would hear, and then I would likely get in Oh, so you used to get like busted in the principal's office and stuff? That's pretty hot. All right. Well, okay, so the thing is, Steve, you're going to be kind of a Steve stand-in for a second for his class clown. So his class clown, like, he basically thought he was Jim Carrey because, like, that's what everybody thought they were in my high school year. Like, all the guys were like, I'm Jim Carrey. Got <laughs> <laughs> talking and stuff like that. So, like, Steve would do this thing where he would find the laugh button in any social situation, like the thing he could just say, and then once he said it and everyone laughed, he would just keep pushing the button over the Like a terrorist, you know what I mean? So, like, for instance, he would do this thing. He would do this, um, what he called a homophobic character. It was really just him saying homophobic shit in a weird voice. But he'd come up to you while you're working on a scene and he's like, What are you? Some kind of gay homo? there and give me the like gay homo whatever the heck thing. Like, what are you gay? Are you gay homo? <laughs> yeah, but like more aggressive, like you want me to die. You're like a gay homo! <laughs> <laughs> exactly. See that that's perfect. Alright, so you're gonna make an excellent clown. And um, I am gonna make you a clown. Okay. So like Steve, Steve would just keep doing that shit over and over until he brought everybody in the room to like some kind of terrible laughgasm. I'm guessing that's why he did it, because like that's a weird guy's way in everyone's panties, right? But then <laughs> Steve, uh, like he would just push all the buttons, and then at some point he discovered this button that he could push with me, and it would just set me off and make everyone go fucking crazy with laughter. So Steve would do this thing where he would say something like like moderately racist to me, like not even that bad, you know, because he knew that he could get a reaction out of me that would entertain fucking everybody, right? So he would be like, hey Des, I'm having a party on Saturday. You want to bring fried chicken and watermelon, right? Um, so can you, in your most irritating Steve voice, ask me if I'm bringing fried chicken and watermelon to your party? Hey Des, do you bring? <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, you're going in the right direction. Yeah, can you Oh shit, Steve, you know I'm gonna be bringing that fried chicken to your birthday party. Cause you know, black people like fried chicken and watermelon almost as much as we like crack. That's right, Steve, that's right. Oh, you know, cause, cause my daddy, Colonel Sanders, raped my mama and your mama, so I love chicken and waffles. Yeah, that's right. I'm gonna do a tap dance for your birthday too, Steve. Cause you know how white people be dancing like this. Don't tell my heart, my achy, breaky heart. And black people be dancing like this. And, uh, white people get pulled over by the cops like this. What seems to be the problem, officer? And black people get pulled over by the cops like this. Oh, shit. Oh. Oh. Yeah, Steve, that's right. I brought fucking sound effects for your party. <laughs> Always baiting me, and I would always take the fucking.
fucking bait like a fucking insane fool, right? And it was this weird time in my life where I was suddenly getting all this attention from all these people. I'm like, oh, she's so funny. And I like hated myself so fucking much at the same time. But I hated Steve more <laughs> because Steve knew that he could do this. Like he just knew that I was in torment, but that it was too funny for him to stop. And he knew that I would always respond. It was like, I was just his bitch and there was nothing I could do about it. I was his unwitting comedy partner. So um, can you now make me a clown, like I made you a clown? But um, use this one, I want to be an ethnically appropriate clown. Uh, yeah, I know, I know, nobody wants to be put in this position, but some people just force your hand, right? <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, nice, it's nice and cool. <laughs> so the thing is, I don't even actually remember the things that Steve would say to me. Like, I don't even remember what I would say back. All I remember is the feeling of the anger I felt. I felt like I was flying on anger. I felt free, because I was allowed to be as angry as I wanted to. But it was like nobody was actually hearing the words that I was saying. You know, it was like I was on fire, but nobody else could see me. <laughs> and all I remember is the aliveness of the feeling, the, the realness of it above everything else, and that nobody else cared. And I'm 17 this whole time, and I'm burning in my own anger and masturbating it like a fucking masochist. I don't, I don't know what to do with this feeling I've never allowed myself to feel. And Steve just keeps egging it on because Steve fucking loves me. Right? You do, right? Yeah. You know what? Let's give him a fucking show. We look great. Come on over here. All right. You ready for a little clown show? Let's do it. I've got a gal named Caroline down where the water is growing. Someday she's going to be mine. Down where the water never grows. And like nobody expects blackface, and then it's just in the middle of my fucking show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the music, right? This is like a great. This looks like all those old album covers. It's like, oh, Sambo the show, the Tar Baby show. <laughs> That's right. It's the fucking Tar Baby show. <laughs> That's right. Okay, are you ready? It's time for the Tar Baby party. You ready? Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes, you are. Okay, good. So take this and wipe that shit off your face, and go sit down. Okay. Thank you so much. It is time, you guys. in the middle of the road. All right, now, you guys are probably wondering what the hell is a tar baby, right? A tar baby is a trap, and we are gonna build one right here, right now, okay? So, we don't have actual tar, we just have some sheets, because we're inside, and this is a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys have bought this whole carnival shtick up until now. So, we are going to make this our big top. So the first thing we're going to need 
to set up our tar baby is a structure, okay? You can't just go throwing tar around. That would make a big mess. So what we are going to do is we are going to add this line to the two that are above your heads already. All right? And that way, anything that we want to hang off of this guy is going to stay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to cover up the strings so that none of them show. So starting in the back, what we got here are some sheets, all right? And all these sheets have a piece of Velcro on them, and that piece of Velcro is going to stick right here. So if you guys will help us by standing up right now, we're going to start hanging some sheets. We're going to stick the, uh, the back part of the Velcro just up to this line, and then once it's stuck there, take the end of the sheet, right? Take it out and wad it all up, big and heavy, and then throw it like your TP in the house. Throw it right over that next line. <laughs> nice. <laughs> awesome. All right, beautiful work. You guys are kidding this real quick. So you guys down here be ready because it's coming down for you, all right? When you see it, make sure it gets over that line and then it's going to get over this one. This first one's almost ready. Well, well, 
What have we here? said Brer Fox, grinning an evil grin. I got you this time, Brer Rabbit. Now, whatever shall I do with you? <gasps> Brer a Rabbit's eyes got very large. Oh, Brer Fox, please, Brer Fox, please do whatever you want with me. Drown me, roast me, hang me, do whatever you please. Only please, Brer Fox, please don't throw me into that briar patch over there. <laughs> briar patch, said Brer Fox. What a wonderful idea. You will be torn into little pieces. And with that, Br'er Fox reached into that tar and grabbed out that tar-covered rabbit and swung him around and around and around and flung him into the briar patch with a whoosh. And then there was silence. Br'er Fox cocked one ear toward the briar patch listening for whimpers of pain, but he heard nothing. nothing. And then uh, Br'er Rabbit, uh, Br'er Fox heard something. It was, it was Br'er Rabbit sitting on the top of the hill on a log, pulling the tar out of his fur with a wood chip and looking smug. <laughs> I was bred and born in the Briar Patch, Br'er Fox. <laughs> born and bred in the Briar Patch. And with that, Br'er Rabbit skipped away just as merry as a cricket in the embers. <laughs> And that, my friends, is the story of the tar baby. Now, a tar baby, as you can see, is a metaphor for a, a, a sticky situation, a problem that you get yourself trapped in, right? You go blasting into, and then it winds up sticking you in it. And it gets worse and worse the more that you mess with it. The more you try to make things better, the more they all turn to shit. <laughs> That story about those animals and their double-crossing trickery has existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the folk tales from people to, uh, from Iran to India to Western Africa to Jamaica, Colombia, Mexico, the Apache and Cherokee Native Americans had a version, and of course so did African American slaves. It's a pretty fantastic fucking metaphor until um, you know, a bunch of southern white racists get their hands on it and just make that a term that you can call black people. Right? Which, I mean, honestly, that is the easiest, most effective way of being a racist. It's just like to thing someone else, you know, to like strip away all the humanity and then just go, now you're a thing, thing, you know, and, 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 and now we own you. And that, that thing is bad and weird and ugly and, and we can do whatever the hell we want with you, thing. And then that way you can start actually making real products like tar baby soap, you know, or wash the black off you. Or, um... Darky toothpaste, which was really a thing, because I guess nothing makes your teeth look whiter than being black. <laughs> oh man, I mean, we're not the only ones. The fucking British tried this shit too. They have this little gollywog thing, which is like a little cute little sambo that was in all these stories, you know? And then they use it as both a marketing tool and a form of derision. That's the spirit, guys. Well done. <laughs> but, um, you know, like, you need to get the two G sounds in the middle of the word. It's not gollywog, it's nigger, you know, faggot. <laughs> like, like, you can't even say the word for the person without throwing up in the middle of it because you just hate them so much. Like, nigger. <laughs> you know, it's actually not the tar baby. That's the black stereotype in that, that story. It's Br'er Rabbit, right? Because think about it. Br'er Rabbit has all the great black qualities of being both sneaky and lazy, which makes no sense. And you're like, I'm going to get you later. <laughs> <laughs> Those are stereotypes, right? You know, and it's like, you know, everything means two things at once. You know, like, oh, the Briar Patch, for instance, right? The Briar Patch is certain death to Br'er Fox and certain freedom to Br'er Rabbit. And uh, the tar baby is either a potential friend or a potential foe, depending on which character you are. And, and Br'er Rabbit is either a trickster or a survivor, depending on your point of view. And Br'er Fox is either the innocent man wrong or a fucking fox trying to eat a fucking rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Trayvon Martin is either a thug in a hoodie or a kid eating Skittles. And um, uh, Michael Brown is either a stone teenager or a violent animal. And uh, Eric Garner won't comply. But he also can't breathe. 
Um, you know, the thing I never understood about the Tar Baby story is why the fuck does Br'er Fox, no, sorry, why does Br'er Rabbit lose his shit at the Tar Baby when the Tar Baby doesn't talk to him? I mean, it's a fucking baby. Do you like, what was he expecting it to say? You know what I mean? Like, also, who punches a baby? <laughs> like, the bigger question, who just hauls off and hits a fucking baby? I mean, like, even if he thinks that this tar baby's a real person, one, it's a baby, and two, all it did was not say shit to him. I mean, why does he get so mad at something that ignores his fucking existence? But, like, when I think about that, I'm like, Desiree, you go fucking crazy when people ignore you. I mean, shit, I'm a fucking performer, <laughs> and I'm a middle child, all right? So I spent the majority of my life both fighting to be seen and trying to disappear at the same time because visibility only ever came with suffering, but I wanted so desperately for anyone to recognize me. And it just makes me crazy, even today as an adult, to like walk down the street past a newsstand where I see rows and rows of images of like beautiful white women, you know, because like, Thin, rich, and white are the three most important things that anybody can be in this world, and no matter how hard I try, there will never be any hope, and that's been the message my whole life. And then, when I look at the picture, it's like inevitably some dumb asshole like Jennifer Aniston on the cover of that shit. <laughs> Thank you so much. It has been 15 years since that bitch did anything anybody <laughs> And most of it was fucking some other famous guy and maybe having a baby. Do you know what I mean? or like asking her what kind of smart water she's drinking or like what she's injecting into her face or what she's doing with her fucking hair, you know? So like we can all want to be like her and put drain cleaner in my fucking hair so I can be, make it pretty and straight like hers. That fucking cokehead, you know? <laughs> 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 like I walk down the same street in this very city and a man of color will look me up and down like I'm a piece of meat and a white guy will look through me like I'm a fucking mailbox standing in the way of some average white chick, you know? Probably smells like a fucking yeast infection but still has more cultural value than I do. <laughs> and, or, no, or, or maybe he is looking at me so he can like, you know, cross me off his fetish bucket list. Fuck me once and then leave me singing the blues. And oh, we know I'm gonna sing the biggest fat black song about it all because that is the only frequency at which my voice gets listened to. That's how I get thinged. And I, none of it, it doesn't, you know, like it doesn't matter, I get it. Like nobody cares if, if Katy Perry wants to wear her hair in cornrows in a fucking video or Miley wants to twerk, you know? But like all of this culture that we keep making in the absence of economic or even physical safety, everyone wants to suck it up into the mainstream, but just not us. Because we're so good to look at over there. You know, <laughs> and it's uh, nobody ever cares about the shit until some white girl starts doing it, and she never even says thank you. You know, and like, and let's not even get into all the sugar in everybody's coffee. You know, <laughs> and all the cotton in everyone's textile mills that created a working and middle class. Because all that is history, Desiree. Okay, get over it. All right, reparations doesn't work. Affirmative action doesn't fix the problem. And also, how come black people are always getting a handout? Um, I don't know, what about the other hand? <laughs> you know, the one that took and took and took and took through the fucking flesh and the culture and the dignity? Like, shit, can we keep something so we can make something of our own? God, all Dobby the house elf needs is a fucking sock. Can a nigga get a sock? <laughs> you know, but like sometimes all the history just globs together and it just sits there in the middle of the fucking road staring at you, waiting for you to say some shit about it. You know, when I think back on all of my history, I remember, you know, the four years I spent at university, Yale University, and how it occurred to me pretty much every day that I was there because of affirmative action. That uh, my 12 years of uh, straight A's and my good SAT scores were maybe good, but maybe not Yale good. You know, maybe not as good as these kids who went to private high schools that I'd never even heard of by the time I was applying to get into college. You know, the kinds of kids who have been successful since the day they were born because their last names are on like buildings and brands and shit. You know, and like the best job that I can get out of college is tutoring fucking rich kids on how to do well on the fucking SAT. You know, and I, I walk up to their houses, these palatial mansions that they have, and I feel like paralyzed by all of the, the resources and the support that they have. And my fucking ancestors made that shit, and I'm embarrassed to walk in the fucking door. 
And then I get in there, and there's, there's never any fucking books on the shelf, you know? There's just pictures of the kid in Cabo and playing with rocks or some shit, you know? And, and invariably, this guy has, like, tutors in every single subject he takes in school, because he will never have to do anything on his own. But I am the one sitting alone, you know, in all of my uh, advanced placement, gifted and talented fucking classes, being the one fat black lump of shit in the class picture, who had better learn how to get a sense of humor if she's going to survive this shit. You know, and, and we're all sitting there one day, you know, in AP U.S. history studying slavery or reconstruction or civil rights or some other period of history built by black hands and owned by white ones, when out of nowhere, Jose does not raise his hand and says something like, when are black people going to get over it? I mean, it's been 40 years since civil rights. When are they going to move on? And I'm speechless <laughs> and, and, and stunned and 16 years old. And, and everyone in class is looking at me. <laughs> and nobody's saying shit. It's like, it's, it's like they all agree with Jose. Like, they've all been wondering the same fucking thing. And they're all just looking at me like, yeah, Desiree, justify your fucking people. Go. And I, you know, I want anybody to, to say anything. Like, uh, yeah, Jose, uh, black people aren't just greedy, lazy, ignorant fucks. Like, we've done some stuff. I seem to remember reading about us doing a bunch of unpaid work and a bunch of undocumented dying, and I, I, I'm guessing we probably did other shit in between that. I just can't find any of it in the fucking book. You know, all I see are like you know, pictures of, of slaves and dead black people swinging from trees that make everybody else look at me. They're all looking at me. I'm looking in the fucking book. You know, like maybe this is how I got into Yale, by the way. You know, but nobody is saying shit. Everyone's just silently witnessing all of this. And and Mr. Our teacher, who is basically Rush Limbaugh, just lets it sit there like a big wet fart. You know what I mean? He's probably agreeing with Jose. He's probably like, yeah, Jose, God, I don't know why black people just don't get over it and let us carry on enslaving the world in peace. I mean, we gave them the ghetto. And I, I want to be smarter and bolder than I am in that moment at 16 years old and say something like, Jose you got a lot of motherfucking nerve with your Pilipino Negrito ass, okay? You are blacker than I am, all right? And let's not act like America ain't dissed and dismissed your country too. Oh, but that's right, Jose. You actually have a country that you came from and a culture and an identity. And we're all just sitting around here stinking up the place, not getting over it. And Mr. How the hell are you teaching an advanced placement U.S. history class when you can't explain to a 16-year-old boy why 40 years of civil rights didn't make up for 400 years of institutionalized apartheid? You know, maybe, maybe they don't teach the shit in American history classes because it's not over yet. Right? It keeps happening. It's still fucking happening from, from slavery to Jim Crow to the war on drugs to prison to death. You know, and, and, and death now execution style in the street on camera, where everybody gets to see it, and go, oh, fuck, man, if that was a fucking blonde bitch named Haley getting shot down, we'd be at DEF CON fucking four right now with that shit. But no, I bring it up and it's suddenly the fucking race card, even though it's not a fucking game. So if you have a problem with hearing about fucking racism in the world, good. Get mad at me. Get mad at it. Get mad at something. Fucking at least engage me like a person instead of trying to not see it and trying to ignore it like, like, like I'm just some kind of petulant child that we're all waiting to cry ourselves to sleep so we can all carry on with business as fucking usual. You know what I mean? Because, like, fuck, everybody wants you to get over this shit, but, like, nobody wants to deal with it. You know? I don't, I don't get it. It's like this, the same impatience everyone has for you when you're fat. It's just like, it's your fucking problem and we're sick of looking at it. You know, everybody looks at you and looks you up and down with just this hatred. You know, they're just like, God damn it, you fat, disgusting fuck. Oh, God, when the fuck are you going to stop being such a fuck up? We are sick of looking at the world with you in it. You are dragging everything down. When the fuck are you going to get over whatever fucked you up? I don't know. Okay. I, I, I don't know, all right? I, when, do I get to, when do I get to mourn the fucked up thing that happened so that I can get over it? Huh? When, do, when does anyone get to mourn 
the fucked up thing that happened so that it can stop happening and so anybody can get over it. Why do I just have to like shoulder the shitty burden and pretend it's not there so everybody else can be happy with their lives? Because you know, if I've got to like just hump this whole race shit on my own and half of us don't have to fucking deal with it, then you're sure as shit I'm going to be fucking nasty and proud and defiant and show my black ass off while I'm fucking doing it. Because I'm having a real hard time continuing to pull the punch because I feel like I've been doing it my whole life and my goddamn back is breaking and I really just want somebody to feel it. This is what black fucking rage looks like. It is not some thug hiding out for you in the fucking alleyway. It's me, your light-skinned, relatable fucking one black friend. And I speak so well, and I laugh at all your racist jokes, and I hate your white fucking guts. You know, like, not, no. <laughs> Just fucking all of you together. You know, it's just like weighing down on me all the fucking time. Do you know what I mean? It's like everyone's like, get over it, get over it. You know, and I, I'm just thinking about all the shit in my life that I didn't do. You know what I mean? All the, the all of the people I didn't meet, all of the chances I didn't take because of some story that somebody else told me about myself before I knew anything. Some other fucking story that I believed. And everybody's like, move on. But I ain't got nowhere to fucking go, do I? This is what I get to live in my limited fucking existence and nobody else has to see it. Nobody has to see me or what I see. I get to be fucking invisible while everybody else just does fucking nothing and some of us are slowly fucking dying in our own skin every fucking day. And nobody wants to do anything, just like a bunch of fucking nothing. Well, you know what the fuck nothing looks like? It looks like this. This is what nothing fucking does. This is what you're nothing fucking get to is everything being fucking destroyed and everyone's getting to live a fucking nothing. Ugh. Fuck. Guitar baby, ladies and gentlemen. Hmm, okay. So now it's awkward. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that fucking thing is always there, you know? And I, I want you to buy me, I want you to buy all of me, but that's just sitting there underneath the surface, and you better know it, because all these people are walking around with that shit just bumping them like a fucking time bomb, while some of us are acting like it's all gonna be fine if we just hug it out. <sighs> I mean, look, I'm not trying to fucking crap on your cupcake here. <laughs> <laughs> I am clearly, you know, no saint. I'm no purist. I obviously love all the things that Western white culture has provided for me, you know, fucking bottled water, their filtered existence, <laughs> mayonnaise and reruns of Frasier. <laughs> <laughs> and like, oh, like really cute white guys. Oh, fuck you guys. I love white guys. Oh, it's like I'm trying to fucking fix racism one dick at a time. <laughs> And, uh, you're, you're kind of my type. Uh, no, you, Blondie. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I borrow you for a minute? Uh, come on, come on. Okay. So, um, yeah. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat right here? And you can, uh, sit down and tell everybody your name. Okay. My name is uh, David. David. Oh, David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to think it real hard. <laughs>
by a, a, a guy just like you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I once knew this sweet guy just like you who was actually a tar baby. And the thing is, any punch I could hurl at him would always leave me punching myself, you know, pulling back, recoiling in horror at the mire that I allowed myself to sink into with him. <sighs> down, down, bubble, bubble, I go. And I could have just left him alone, I'm thinking, as I'm breathing my last slowly drowning in the shame and defeat that I feel when I'm underneath his skin. But I could not resist him. I mean, he taunted me with that face. <laughs> yeah, all shy and fucking cute. And I was compelled to say, howdy. I said, how are you? Why don't you answer me? And he just remains surrounded in this halo of silence as I am slowly drawn into his secret. He stands there, this monument to everything that I thought precious beyond utterance, and he mocks me by just displaying it all so openly. All of that uh, pride and sadness I hold deep within, he bears like Girl Scout badges on his sleeves. I once knew a man who was so black, it would never show up on his skin. <laughs> I mean, what's the color of nothing? You know, what part of a palette best paints a void? His blackness was this, uh, was this confusion, um, a, a, a sadness, a theft, an abyss. You know, David, it's, um, it's not the blackness that you see that's scary. It's the pitch that draws you in from a beautiful, translucent surface. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, um, can, I, can, I, can I touch your unwavering confidence? <laughs> Start apologizing for shit they never did. <laughs> no, don't get left. 
Um, or, um, oh my God, everybody thinks you can dance when you're black, even when you can't. Do you know what I mean? It's like, everyone's like, what's this move? I'm like, I'm getting a rock out of my shoe. I'm the fuck down. <laughs> but like, I'm saying, I get a lot of mileage out of being the exotic other. And I feel like, David, you could probably get some of this mileage too, because you're an exotic other to some people like me, right? Like, I, I look at white guys and I'm just like, wow, what the, what the fuck is it like to be a white guy? Do you know what I mean? Like, what's it like to, what is it like to know that you can go anywhere in the world right now and be totally fine? It's annoying because I, I feel, I feel, Does you feel guilty? I feel guilty. Yeah. And, and I realize that that's ridiculous. Yeah, but it's like in moments you kind of feel guilty, but then when you're there, you're kind of like, this is sweet, you know? <laughs> <laughs>
And then I wanted to fill it up with me, because I'm a dick like everyone else, and all dicks want to do is fill up space. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but this, this is almost like it was in the beginning. Do you remember that, like, one little pocket of a moment when we started the show off, and, and everybody was sitting here, and, and you couldn't see each other, but you were trying to feel each other in the dark? <sighs> close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Actually, I don't trust you. Rafa, close your eyes, please. <laughs> all right, now remember. Remember when we had all let go of all of our little particular things, and, and we didn't know what was going to happen, but we were so excited to be in a place where anything could happen. This blackness is you, too. And uh, yeah, I know that that feels maybe scary or, or dangerous. Trust me, I, I, I know. But just know this. At our core, each of us, uh, we're nothing. And we spend all of our lives trying to figure out all the things that we are and the things everyone else is not or the other way around. When the most beautiful and most true part of each of us is darkness, undefined. Can you feel that if you strain 